cognitive load management, a new skill we all need to make sense of a complex world. My name is Graham Codrington and this is a module in the course An Introduction to Adaptive Intelligence and Problem Solving from the Future of Work Academy. My brain is fried. Sorry, what did you say? I've been listening to this podcast for 20 minutes and just now realized I haven't heard a thing. I don't know if any of those sorts of things happen to you. Uh, they have happened to me. Uh, just when your brain seems to shut down a little bit. You know, our brains are remarkable things. Thousands of times more powerful than the most powerful computers and capable of doing many different things at once. We're only aware of just a fraction of what the brain makes us aware of through our consciousness. Most of the brain's activity is done without us even being aware of it. And no, it's absolutely not true that we only use a small percentage of our brain's power. We use it all. We're only aware of a small fraction of it. And yet, our brains have limits. And our brains have mechanisms to manage what happens when we get near those limits. From headaches and blackouts even, to sleep, tiredness, and even memory loss, the brain protects itself from overload. So an important skill for every person to develop is to know the capability of your own brain and maximize this capability as far as possible. Know and develop your brain's capability. Some of the capabilities of our brains are fixed and each of us has a different base level of brain activity and functioning. But almost all of our brains can be developed and enhanced, from IQ to endurance. One of the most important capabilities we will need in the future of work is called cognitive load management. This is the ability to discriminate and filter information for importance and to understand how to maximize cognitive functioning using a variety of tools and techniques. Now, the Wikipedia entry for cognitive load management accessed in November 2017 says it like this. Cognitive load management refers to the total amount of mental effort being used in the working memory. Cognitive load theory was developed out of the study of problem solving by John Sweller in the late 1980s. And it refers to three different types of cognitive load, intrinsic, extraneous, and germane. Now, if you're only listening to my voice and not watching the screen, you may want to just uh, turn to your screen now and have a look at the infographic uh, that was included in that Wikipedia article, because it explains these three different aspects of cognitive load management. Intrinsic cognitive load is the effort associated with a specific topic and refers to the inherent complexity of what is being learnt. In, in other words, when we're trying to learn new information, take stuff in, if we're trying to get our brain to work on information, one of the aspects that makes it easier or harder is the actual complexity of the material itself. Um, there's very little you can do about this. Either what you're trying to learn is easy or hard, uh, you know, simple or difficult. Um, but you can balance that. So you don't just have to overload your brain with five hours in a row of really difficult stuff. So the first thing to think about is the intrinsic load. The second aspect is the extraneous cognitive load, which refers to the way information or tasks are presented. And this load is created by the impediments to learning. Uh, what we really mean by that is what are the distractions? What's going on around you? Um, what else is your brain needing to, to think about or to focus attention on? And, and how can you get distracted? Uh, extraneous cognitive load should be avoided, obviously, where possible. Germane cognitive load refers to the work put into creating a permanent store of knowledge, or what sometimes is called a schema. Uh, this happens when 
we are trying to take information and put it into our longer term memory to make sense of that information. Um, now, when a course is well designed and when we are using proper techniques and tools to facilitate an effective learning process, well, then we reduce that uh, the cognitive load um, and we maximize what we call the germane load. What this means, we'll talk about a, a little bit later, uh, where you actually work on simple concepts and build them up to something that has more complexity. Each of these aspects of cognitive load is becoming more and more important in a world where ever more information is created and communicated and we are confronted by ever more complexity in our everyday lives. Add to that the fact that we have many more ways of being distracted these days and it's clear that we've got a problem, a problem with brain overload. The future workforce is going to need to develop skills, tools and techniques to prevent information overload and to filter out the irrelevant noise amongst the useful data. While tools do exist to categorize information and help people locate the right data, the ability to use these tools effectively will become a highly valued skill for employees in the future. People who are able to cope with this will find themselves standing out from the crowd. So what must we do to develop these skills? What are the skills that need to be developed? Well, here's a list of six. Quickly process lots of information from different sources, discarding what's not relevant and keeping what is. Secondly, learn better and faster and integrate new information coherently and change one's mind when new information arrives. Thirdly, prioritize work that must be done and be able to do the most important work first, to completion, with minimal distractions. Fourthly, be able to remove and ignore distractions and focus on what is being done. Fifth, choose between multiple options in a way that maximizes productivity. And finally, use tools and techniques to remember key information and have it accessible quickly and appropriately when needed. A heavy cognitive load can have negative effects on task completion, concentration and learning. It can feel like you're in a mist, in, in a fog even. Heavy cognitive load is experienced, sadly, more by older people, as our brains naturally slow down. But it's also experienced by children and by students or people learning new skills. With increased distractions in the world today, people become more prone to experiencing cognitive loads. This can result in reduced ability to learn, lower levels of productivity, and inability to handle stress. We therefore need to develop our abilities to handle cognitive loads. You might even be struggling right now with this lesson as you listen to me or watch this video, because our brain naturally tries to shut us down when we reach a level of cognitive load. Um, if that's happening to you, just take a pause, just take a minute or two, stand up, stretch, walk around and come back to the rest of the lesson. We're about to get more practical, so we do need your focus. Developing your ability to manage cognitive load involves three key issues. Learning to learn better, dealing with distractions, and prioritizing. Learning doesn't stop when we finish formal education and get a qualification. We know this, but how many of us continue to develop our learning abilities? It's beyond the scope of this article, and in fact, even the, the scope of this course in the Future of Work Academy to do a full learning styles course. We do recommend that you find one, or, or maybe even more than one, and continue to improve your ability to learn new information. By the way, if we discover any great courses, we're going to include them in the list of uh, further recommended resources that you'll find at the bottom of this article on the web page. So it, it won't be in this uh, video or audio version, but go on to the Future of Work Academy um, and get to the web page for the Cognitive Load Management uh, module and you'll find some additional resources. If you find any great learning styles courses, 
um, please make sure you let us know, uh, put them into the Facebook discussion group or contact us directly so that we can make sure we uh, share that information with everybody. Learning style courses would help you to learn things like how to use mind maps or mnemonics or memory tools, for example. I mean, there are some fantastic memory experts who can train you to dramatically improve your memory, and, and that's just going to be immensely valuable to you. So, uh, first of all, continue to learn how to learn. Secondly, we need to reduce the extraneous load in learning. So, we need to deal with distractions better. We need to filter out every needless task that is not critical to the learning process and make sure that whenever we are working with new information, we try and access it in easy and understandable ways that are chunked into logical sections. Uh, follow a simple to complex strategy, ensuring that you first master the fundamental principles of a task before you move on to its more complex processes. Start with building blocks and then develop into complexity. Uh, to do this, you need to develop schemas and frameworks. Don't just learn facts. Learn how these facts fit together into larger holes and frameworks. Now, holes is not holes in the wall. It's, it's holes like holistic ideas. That's essentially what a framework or a schema is. It gives you to put all the cogs together and it makes sense of the bigger picture. This is how someone achieves expertise. When multiple elements of information are chunked as single elements, there is more working memory capacity available for solving problems and processing information. In addition, schemas or frameworks can get automated if they are repeatedly and successfully applied. Automated schemas directly steer behavior and are not consciously processed in working memory, so they free up cognitive load. Now, that maybe needs a bit of an example to help you out there. And the best example is learning to drive a car, especially a manual car or what they call stick shift in, in the United States. Early on, it's, it's hard. Uh, you've got a, your feet with the pedals and your hands with the gear lever and the, the, the levers and paddles and buttons and trying to turn on the aircon and the radio at the same time and then driving and then you've got to add traffic into that. There are many, many different things to do, but what you do is you break each of those up into their smallest components, what your left foot is doing, what your right foot is doing, left hand, right hand, eyes, and so on. And, and as you build all of these up, each of them begins to become more and more automated and more and more automatic. By the time you've been driving for a number of years, you might discover you're not thinking about it at all. Uh, which in itself might be slightly dangerous and where a lot of accidents come from, that's a different story for another day. Another thing that you can do to reduce cognitive load is to use visual techniques and present information in more accessible ways. Using infographics, for example, rather than spreadsheets or bullet-pointed slides or pages of single-spaced Times New Roman size 10 text, how we present information is vital to reducing the cognitive load of everyone around us and ourselves. We're actually going to look at the issue of visual thinking as one of the modules on this particular course. Now, while we're talking about cognitive load, let's deal with one key issue, and that's multitasking. Is it good? Is it bad? By the way, uh, you're probably going to need to multitask a little bit if you're watching the video or, or listening to the audio here, because in the section on multitasking, there are quite a few links that we've suggested. There's a lot of good stuff written about multitasking, and we've included links to uh, research, um, links to some articles. Uh, now, obviously, I can't put those links into the audio file. Uh, it's a little bit complex on the video. So please make sure that you check them out on the Academy website in the web page version of this module. Uh, they really are worth looking at. Anyway, back to multitasking. This is one of the most discussed issues in the workplace, especially as younger people tend to use lots of devices simultaneously, listen to music while they're working, even watch TV shows. They update Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat regularly throughout the day. 
but is this ability to do multiple things at once a blessing or a curse? Is it actually as good as it appears? The science seems to indicate that for almost everyone, it is not a good thing. Research has found that just over 2%, that's 2 in every 100 people, are brilliant at multitasking. And they suffer no drop in performance when doing multiple tasks. The, the researchers call these guys super taskers. The special group was discovered actually by accident by psychologists at the University of Utah. David Strayer and Jason Watson were investigating why talking on a mobile phone in a car is so much more dangerous than chatting to a passenger who's in the car with you. Uh, by the way, the reason is that the passengers will naturally cease their conversation with you whenever things are getting tricky, or they'll even intervene to alert the driver to, to other issues. Uh, when you're just talking to somebody on the other end of the phone, they're not able to actually help you with, with some of that uh, driving concentration stuff. Uh, these researchers discovered that about 2% of people had no discernible change in their driving. No matter what the situation, no matter what the distractions were, they were able to divide their, con their concentration effortlessly without their performance suffering. But that's only 2%. Are you in this group? Look, I hate to be rude and I don't know you, but it's unlikely. And the problem is that thinking you're a super tasker doesn't make you one. But most people think they are. Most people are not. But even if you're not a super tasker, multitasking actually can be good for you in a limited way. Multitasking is hardest when the tasks you're trying to do are similar to each other. But it's actually easier and, and even a little bit beneficial if they are very different. So, chatting on the phone and writing an email at the same time is quite difficult because they involve similar thinking processes, of verbal, finding words, putting them together, making sense, and so on. If you want to generate meaningful sentences, uh, you can't really do that. However, talking to somebody while playing the piano is actually reasonably easy. Well, <laughs> assuming you know how to play the piano, of course. It's also more difficult to multitask when the tasks require similar levels of brain function. You know, some things require a lot of brain functionality uh, and, and some don't. So, you know, solving a complex maths equation is quite difficult. Um, going for a walk where your brain just has to control your physical body, not so much. So, if you're writing an article for the company newsletter while doing mathematical calculations and searching for information on a conference you want to attend, well, those are all similar brain functions and you're not going to be very productive trying to do all three at once. It would be a whole lot better for you to complete each one in turn rather than skipping back and forth between them. But if you're busy thinking about what you want to write in the company newsletter and you take a walk around the block, that can actually help you uh, because they are different tasks taking up different parts of your brain. While you're doing each of your tasks, let's say those complex tasks we were talking about, mathematical equations, writing an email, or so on, if you play a few minutes of a computer game, or listen to some music, or as I said, take a walk, or have a TV show playing in the background, it can actually even help you. Kelvin Liu and Alan Wong from the Chinese University of Hong Kong gave participants a computer task which involved searching for visual information while also responding to certain sounds that could help them with their search. They found that people who regularly used three or four different media at a time were better at integrating the information that came in through their eyes and ears and other senses. Since real life actually involves a lot of integration of different senses, this is actually a good skill to have. Another study conducted in 2015 at the University of Florida surprised even its authors. Now, by the way, as I said, we, we have put links to all of these studies. So if you are interested, 
uh, you can go and uh, read up about these studies uh, for yourself. Just get onto the Future of Work Academy website and get to the Cognitive Load Management uh, course page. So at this University of Florida study, people were asked to sit on exercise bikes and to cycle for two minutes at a speed they found comfortable. This set a baseline for them. Later they cycled again, but this time they had a screen in front of them which had a variety of different cognitive tests. Uh, from easy tests where they just had to say go whenever a blue star appeared on the screen, to much harder tasks, for example, memorizing a long list of numbers and then reciting them backwards, uh, you know, in reverse order. They completed other similar cognitive tests while sitting on a chair in a room, and researchers then compared the results. When people were sitting on an exercise bike, the interesting thing is they pedaled 25% faster than their baseline without even realizing it, and they were also able to do slightly better with the problems themselves. This is a case where distraction actually seemed useful to both uh, things, you know, the exercise, the physical exercise and the mental exercise. The authors speculate that anticipation of the tasks might have increased arousal in the brain, which also made people more efficient at cycling. Now, I'm a runner and I certainly find this. Uh, when I put music in my headphones, when I go out running, I, I run to the cadence, to the rhythm of the music. But when I put an audio book or a podcast or I give myself a mental challenge while I'm running, um, I actually end up running a little bit faster and I find that I'm actually able to, to engage with what I'm listening to or get my brain to solve the problem. So multitasking may have its downsides and there are certain times when it's not good at all, but it isn't always bad. There are certain circumstances under which we are actually better when we are multitasking. And this is when we feel relaxed when we've been doing a mentally creative exercise which encourages us to think more broadly and when we mix and match a variety of different activities uh, for our brain to do. There's an excellent article available on the web page called Multitasking Good or Bad and I'd highly recommend that you read it. If you want to maximize your multitasking skills, choose a low cognitively demanding task and pair it with something that isn't too risky if your attention slips for a bit. Otherwise, if you're working on tough tasks that require lots of focus, it's best to do each one in turn and minimize distractions or attention splitting. Again, we've put two fantastic articles for you to read on the web page. Is multitasking bad for you or not? Um, and another, um, uh, that one, by the way, might freak you out a bit and you might never try to multitask again, uh, then there's another one that we put which is more positive. Uh, you do need to take it with a, a pinch of salt, but there are 12 great points to help judge for yourself how good your parallel processing abilities are. Companies are looking for people who can handle a high cognitive load. Laszlo Bock, who is Google's Head of People Operations, was interviewed on this very topic, and now let me quote him. Laszlo said, For every job, the number one thing we at Google look for is general cognitive ability. It's not IQ. It's learning ability. It's the ability to process on the fly. It's the ability to pull together disparate bits of information. End of quote. In other words, Google are looking for a candidate's ability to manage cognitive load. Cognitive load management will be increasingly important as our modern organizations move further away from the technical problems of the past to more and more of the adaptive challenges of the unknown future. Especially if we are to ensure that our cognitive and collaborative efforts are not wasted on the misalignments in the system and unnecessary information flows that often inundate our organizations into effect ineffectiveness, we need to develop our abilities to handle capacity overload or cognitive overload. In fact, we must never get near cognitive overload. Laszlo again says this, a world rich in information streams in multiple formats 
and from multiple devices brings the issue of cognitive overload to the fore. Organizations and workers will only be able to turn the massive influx of data into an advantage if they can learn to effectively filter and focus on what is important. Now, I realize that we haven't given you a whole lot of practical tools in this particular module. Uh, you're going to get some really good tools in the rest of this particular course on adaptive intelligence and complex problem solving. Uh, so keep going with the course and, and there will be some practical tools for you to develop your ability to handle cognitive load. But what we wanted to do was make sure that you put this on your radar as something that you need to develop. Uh, read the articles that we've suggested, go to the web page uh, and have a look at some of the additional resources that we've laid out for you and focus your attention on those three areas learning to learn better, dealing with distractions, and prioritizing your learning processes. Make sure that you develop your ability to handle cognitive load. You won't regret it.